The following recording is a part of SCIF's Travels Path Forward series of online summits. To discover and register for future events, visit forum.skift.com. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for Travels Path Forward, Startups and Investors. This online summit is a part of a series of virtual discussions that Skift is host hosting as a rapid response to tactical ideas, uh, analysis, and resilience for the industry as it responds to the coronavirus challenge. Uh, we're hosting a series of these webinars uh, weekly and highlighting these discussions across the industry as it responds. We'd like to thank all of our incredible speakers today for sharing their time and perspectives. We will be recording this event and interviews for archival on our website, should you miss any of these discussions. There will be no Q&A via Zoom. However, uh, a number of attendees have already sent in questions via email, and you can respond uh, with questions via the hashtag, hashtag Skiff Summit on Twitter to ask questions. To kick things off, please join me in welcoming Skiff's CEO and founder, Rafat Ali. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our second Skift online summit. We are doing a series of these through the next few weeks and next few months. Uh, Skift has been covering, obviously, what's happening over the last, I would say, three months at this point. We started early in uh, Jan, covering what was happening in this part of China. And then, obviously, because Chinese travelers are one of the world's biggest forces, and any changes in it uh, seems to affect the travel industry very um, in all parts. That's why we've been covering it from the start. Uh, we started this live blog, the slide that you will see, we started this about a month and a half ago. Uh, if you go to Skiff homepage, you will see this is where all the action is. We're covering this from our own stories, our research analysts, our journalists have been covering it 24 seven, as well as we're also aggregating and curating coverage from all parts of the world there as well. Um, uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, we are doing these series of online summits, one and a half hours to two hours, one every week for the next um, month, two months. These are the list that's, that's up there. This is the one, obviously, you're in the startups and investors one. Uh, we're going to have destination marketing, travel PR, loyalty, short-term rentals, online travel, hotels, travel advisors, and luxury travel. Uh, you can go to forum.skift.com and you will see a list of all of these and you can click and register for, for all of them if you want, or you can register for, for any of them. Uh, obviously, uh, we at Skift have been the independent voice of, I would say, reason in, in these times. And if you want to support what we're doing, and you know we are the media company that's in the middle of this storm as well as obviously covering the storm as well so if you want to support independent journalism in these crucial times you can go to my.skift.com support and um, support our work you can uh, pay whatever you want obviously these webinars are pay what you want as well so i want to kick off this um uh, this summit by uh, interviewing somebody that I've been, I've known for a very long time, Azim Azar, who I think I've known since um, maybe his Reuters days where he was the chief innovation officer there uh, and has done many things since then, has started companies, has been an advisor, board member, has, is also now a VC as well, and started Exponential View Azar when? I think two years ago, maybe? Uh, five years ago. Can five you... years ago. Wow. Yeah. You, 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 you look the same, by the way. Um, and by the way, the, the, the wind through your hair looks beautiful right now. Um, I'm, on the, I'm on the beach. You're on the beach, clearly. Uh, so exponential view is a very, I would say, clear-eyed view of what's happening in cutting-edge tech today and what is to come. So Azim has been writing about coronavirus, I think, for like three months now from, from the very start and very clear eyed analysis of what's happening. Uh, you wrote this article, Azim, on what's happening with startups and sort of the, the, the path that I had from here, which uh, obviously us as a startup, I um, found a lot of truth in there. So I figured I will get you on to get a landscape view of what's happening from a, from a tech perspective, from a startup mm -hmm. perspective, and how do you see the recovery happening from here? So um, let's start at the 30,000 foot view as you're sitting here today on your beach. Uh, what are your views of 
of the recovery and how long would it take from here? Let's just start from the top. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you um, very much, Rafat. It, it actually is an incredible pleasure um, to be on Skift. I've, I've always been impressed by your innovation and the business's innovation over the many years uh, that you've really created this category. And I, I've spent a lot of time over the last four or five weeks talking with uh, economists and C-level execs and investors in a lot of different uh, industries. Um, from kind of consumer to B2B, supply chain, IT, all sorts of places. Um, and I've read quite a bunch of um, the, the, the forecasts that have come through. And my current view is that um, this is harder and deeper than anything we have gone through in recent history, not the global financial crisis, not the 9-11 um, uh, crisis, not uh, the dot-com bubble, um, that it, it is deep, uh, very, very serious, and is in a sense breaking the forecasting models of lots of the existing analysts out there. So one of the things that you may notice is that um, every couple of weeks, a particular ba investment bank or a consultancy will revise its forecast for US GDP for the year. Mm -hmm. And they keep revising their, their forecasts down. They get more and more pessimistic. And it's kind of a psychological trick. I don't think they're willing to go out and say, we think this is going to be um, really, really bad. My own personal planning, I have not built a spreadsheet to do this, um, is that it, things will look much, much worse than the sort of 6.2% overall decline that Goldman Sachs was recommending, was not recommending, was suggesting uh, a, a few weeks ago. Um, and the reason is that, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to come out of this at some point, but when we come out of it, 25% of the, the economy of the workforce will be unemployed. People will be um, tired and scared. Uh, businesses will need to start to restart and we will have lost a couple of quarters of consumer spending, which makes up 70% of the US economy. Uh, when, we, when we look at the startups that we're, where we help, you know, we've really told them to batten the hatches, reduce costs, figure out where they need to head, raise what money they can now, um, and expect a long slog. We have the benefit of having lived through the dot-com bubble and 9-11 and the global financial crisis, so we know what it looks like. Mm. Uh, so I think it's pretty, um, it's going to be a pretty challenging couple of years. So when they say, I mean, there's all these cliches, and I'm sure you've seen all of these LinkedIn posts or people talking about um, sort of... Uh, these are the times that the startups are born and the startups that are born now are the ones that become great down the line. How much credence do you put into that? Um, yeah, uh, we did see great companies uh, get started around the, the time of this, um, uh, of, these, of these changes. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges is knowing when capital will start to uh, return and present itself to the market. So the venture capital um, community has a bunch of dry capital, uninvested dry powder, mm -hmm. but they also have a ton of companies whose assumptions of where they're getting their funding from um, has, has now, have now changed fundamentally. Uh, and so it, because the VCs are going to be unlikely to raise money from their underlying LPs at the same frenetic rate they were in 2019, they have to figure out how to make the, their existing capital reserves last. W what that means fundamentally is there's less capital to go around. That doesn't prevent you, I think, uh, as a founder today saying, listen, I'm going to observe what's going on. I'm going to find some new secular trend that's going to emerge as a consequence of life post coronavirus. And with my buddy, the two of us are going to sit in our remote Zoom rooms and start this thing to, today. But mm -hmm. I think it's a very different position if you're already in the market um, and you've already got headcount 20, 30, 50, 500 people and you need to think, um, how am I gonna make it through the next uh, 12 to 18 months? You wrote this in this, in, this, in this essay about sort of the dimensionality of recovery. There's the X and Y, those are the charts that we've seen obviously. There's the Z axis that nobody is talking about. So explain what that means. Yeah, sure. So. Um, I've actually got a prop. I've got a ball for this uh, on my desk. Uh, when we look at the, um, the, the graphs of um, the, the economy, 
uh, analysts say, listen, is this going to be a, a, a V-shaped re recession? So we're going to go down and bounce back up. It looks like a V. Is it going to be a U where you go down and you, you sit flat and you come back up? Will it be a V where it's a really slow return? Uh, what shape will it take? And the thing is that all they care about is fundamental top line GDP number. That's what mm. they're measuring. But as entrepreneurs, we actually care about the shape of the world and what happens to our business. And when you just have kind of financial shocks, as you, you did in um, uh, the, the global financial crisis, the way that you recover is kind of just along the same path that you were traveling before. But it, in practice today, where the shock is really hitting ways of life, you know, we cannot go out and buy baking powder and, and flour in the UK. You can't go on a vacation. You can't leave your house, get a haircut, look at my hair. Um, you're going to see fundamental shifts in behavior. And so I describe this as like, it's, it's a Z axis, as a dimension, the ball comes and it bounces as, because of coronavirus. And then it shoots off in another direction. In absolute terms, the economy returns, but where it returns to is a different place to where it had otherwise been been going. And, and I think that's particularly relevant for, for travel because, you know, people are, travel has been about, about, you know, free borders and being able to hop on a plane or a train and go somewhere else. That's been curtailed and those restrictions will ease. Um, but it's also about mass gatherings of people, whether it's in, um, you know, in uh, Lollapalooza or on a cruise ship. Um, and those are the types of, of behaviors that might fundamentally take a while to, to return and where you could expect this sector to bounce in a slightly different direction. But mm -hmm. even in, in sectors that are finding it easier, like in um, uh, uh, take the video conferencing sector, the direction that a Zoom, which is we're on today, is taking is different to the one they were taking six weeks ago, right? They've mm -hmm. just, Eric Yuan, the CEO, has stood up and said, we are stopping, we are changing our product roadmap for the next 90 days. All our resources are in a direction that is different to the one we had set before coronavirus hit. And that is kind of proof positive of this idea of the Z-axis. Z-axis. Uh, you also mentioned on resilience versus relevance and startups that will be resilient, but also be relevant coming out of this. Explain what you meant by that. Yeah. So uh, right now, as a CEO of a startup or, of, or an investor, you're concerned about its survival. Um, and its survival is, is fundamentally, um, you know, do not run out of cash, number one. Um, and then number two, how, how resilient is a team? How much energy do they have to continue this fight? Because the world just got a whole lot harder. Um, and, and, but the relevance is really about um, what are the assumptions that you had made about why your startup mattered? and why there was a market into which it was going to, to grow that may have changed if we think there has been some fundamental secular shift to the, um, uh, to the, to the way in which key people are going to behave. Mm -hmm. There are some startups uh, in distance learning and drone delivery that have just raised money. And so they're resilient, they're financially resilient. They're also highly relevant because we see these sectors growing for at least the next couple of years and potentially longer. There are those startups which have raised money, but are not necessarily um, in uh, sectors which, which are going to come back very, very quickly. I would hypothesize that some travel businesses, group travel and so on, might fall into that category. They've got, they've got full coffers, but they're not so relevant. And then you've got the startups that are highly relevant, but just don't have the cash to get through the next year or two because they were planning to raise funding rounds, but this funding spigot has changed. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out as a CEO, where do I actually live? Um, I think that the, the hardest place to live is obviously if your resilience is, is low, um, but if you want to come out and flourish, you have to figure out how you're going to be relevant running into a post coronavirus world. Um, and you, I, I think it is, um, it is hubristic, or maybe it's naive, it's one of the two, to assume that the shape of the world that we get to in 18 months to 24 months is going to look a lot like the shape of uh, January 2020. Mm -hmm. I suspect a lot of fundamental assumptions about people's behavior will, will have, have moved, um, and you'll, you'll need to use what time you have to think of a, a careful pivot to your business. Um, in terms of 
uh, consumers that may have money lying in their banks coming out of this because we're realizing that uh, unfortunately in many ways people are not being able to spend so they're saving a lot of money in their banks that are sitting there. Uh, a lot of people obviously have lost jobs but but let's keep that aside for a second. Where, how do you think uh, the savings that they have in their accounts will be spent going ahead as we start to come up? You know, um, it's really early on and I'm not a, um, I'm not a psychologist. So take this for uh, as somebody who's just been in business for 25 years and, and done a few things. Um, even what's coming out of China is that there is a little bit of a sense of relief that the restrictions have been eased and uh, there's been a, a tremendous spending on makeup <laughs> for, mm. for, as, as one example. And travel bookings are up in China, but they're not, as you know, better than me, they're not re get to, they haven't got to approve right. coronavirus levels. Um, my sense would be that consumers will sit down and um, have a real deep thought about what do we, do we actually need to spend? How difficult were the last six months? How many sleepless nights did we have? Um, because we didn't feel that we were personally resilient enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we avoid feeling that uh, again? And, and I talked to friends of mine who lived through SARS, uh, Taiwanese friends, and they said that, you know, it took them a good couple of years from the comparatively smaller impact of SARS over six months to start to feel like they were, you know, back to their usual selves. Now, they, mm -hmm. they, you know, this is, that's, that's an anecdote rather than data. Um, but my inbound assumption as I look at um, my own personal um, portfolio is that consumers will, may spend some money to uh, just really blow off some steam and have that much deserved meal that is not around their kitchen table. Um, but they're, they're not going to want to go out and spend very, very heavily, nor will the capacity be there, right? Because if you think about um, an airport, right? The, air the airport is in a kind of mothball position. Airlines have furloughed their staff, their planes have got, um, have been drained of fuel and drained of, um, uh, engine oil and lubricants and put into a kind of mothball situation, that capacity will take time to return. And I think the, the airline that I've been tracking that has been the most sanguine about this has been the CEO of Lufthansa, who has had kind of characteristic German directness about mm. just how long he thinks this process will, will take. So I think both on the supply side, it'll take time for the, uh, these, the wheels to spin to, to service the consumer. And the consumer is going to be a little bit more circumspect, a bit more nervous and a bit less generous with their wallets. Let's move through a couple of quick questions before we end. So automation, it's a, it's a topic that you've covered obviously for a long time. Um, there's some thought in the travel industry, the automation as a result of safety and the cost will become much bigger going ahead. Historically hadn't had a, had a, had a big runway so far in the industry. What are your views on automation in general or will the cheap labor costs coming out of this offset some of that? Yeah, it's a really important, um, it's a really important question. And uh, to some extent, that will depend on where governments, um, how governments decide they want their economies to um, develop over the next 20, 20 to 30 years. But the argument that I hear when I talk to um, senior execs who have supply chains is, uh, we have to make our supply chains more resilient. The Chinese weren't just cheap, they were really good at what they did and they had expertise that, that was very, very deep. So this is going to be a longer term, more complicated process, um, but there's only one way that we can compete on the cost and that is through higher in, um, investments in automation and robotics if we want to nearshore or ultimately reshore uh, bit, bits of production. So the expectation would be that that reshoring will, will take place and it will take place in an automa relatively automation heavy way. Um, but that also makes sense because if you are going to you know, build a factory in 2021 or 2022 in the United States, um, it would make sense to, to put robots uh, in it rather than mm -hmm. you know, long production lines staffed by, uh, staffed by people. Um, it, it is possible that governments may may insist on, you know, policy-wise having, having employees there. But I, my sense, again, is that 
uh, only very short-sighted governments would do that. And rather than that, they would be looking for a meaningful job creation in sectors which are growing but have uh, fundamentally struggled with, um, with, with, it, with enough resources. I mean, in the United Kingdom, mm. one of those sectors is social care, right? Looking after older and vulnerable people, which is uh, you know, a growing sector that has been traditionally under-resourced. Uh, just last question. You said you're working, you wrote um, that you're working on a framework for reopening cities. I know you're going to launch it next week. So everybody has to actually subscribe to exponentialview.co if you want to go. Um, but if you want to give a preview of, of your view on how to reopen our cities. Yeah, so I think the, um, the biggest challenge is uh, that we have to uh, overcome is that this virus is a localized phenomenon. We look at nationalized and global data, but ultimately it spreads in clusters. Uh, and so the, the tighter you can zero in on um, where clusters are, whether it's cities or sub-districts, the better you can control your, um, you know, getting back to some sense of, no of normality. So when I think about, um, when I think about cities, I think one of the critical things is um, how, how has our data allowed us to talk about, see and understand where we are with the infection rates and what control mechanisms do we then have to manage whether infections are coming in and whether they're spreading at a city or sub-district level. And I think it's particularly hard in the U United Kingdom where city authorities don't really have a lot of resources, nor do they have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. I think in mayoral cities, um, and the US is a good example, um, you do have more resources accessible and more ordinances that mayors can, can take a hold of. But the opening gambit has to be, do I have my localized data? Can I track and trace people correctly? And can I start to have localized quarantines that allow parts of the city to work. And when it happens, it happens very slowly. Essential workers, the people who support essential workers, well before we get to the people like me who, uh, you know, waffle for a living. All right, thank you, Azim. Thank you very much, that was, that was fascinating. Appreciate it, thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. So, uh, and thank you to Azim and Rapid. Um, as we move forward, uh, I've launched a poll uh, asking, how will travel startups weather this crisis? Will they come out stronger and more nimble? Uh, will many of them uh, disappear or have operations decimated? Or will the crisis have little long-term effect? So please answer that and I will share uh, responses during this next session uh, briefly. So next up, uh, we're gonna have our first panel of this summit uh, focused on investors and the venture capital space. This conversation will feature uh, Thayer Ventures co-founder and managing director, Chris Hemeter, uh, Maura P. Walsh of uh, Enterprise Ireland, and will be moderated by Seth Borko, senior research analyst at Skift. All right, well, thank you both so much for, for joining me. I really appreciate you guys joining the Zoom call. And I just wanna kind of reiterate the caliber of the people that we're joined by because uh, Maura, Senior Vice President for Digital Technologies at Enterprise Ireland, and that is the venture and business development arm of the Irish government, which I didn't realize the Irish government had a venture arm, but I'm very impressed with that. And uh, she's based out of San Francisco and oversees their travel technology portfolio globally. And Chris Hemeter, uh, as we said, co-founder and managing director of Thayer. Thayer is probably one of the oldest and, and largest venture capital firms that specializes in travel and technology. And Chris is, is very well known in the space and he's been investing in travel companies forever. So thank you both so much for joining me. Pleasure. My pleasure, thank you. So I, I, there's two things I wanna discuss with you guys in terms of how venture capital is, is reacting to the crisis. And, th and there's two sides to it, right? And we discussed this with the team. The first is damage control. And then the second is looking at opportunities. So maybe we'll start with the the damage control side of things. So how are you both, this is a question for both of you, how are you working with your, your port, current portfolio of companies to cope and manage through this crisis? Um, so Seth and team, thanks so much for having me. Um, I think one thing that's really key for us is, um, you know, it's definitely a two-sided um, affair. Um, one thing is we have 40 offices around the, uh, around the globe to help support 
the, the companies we invest with and that we help scale. So having people on the ground in those markets, actually helping companies, talking about market conditions and really talking to key stakeholders, that's one part. And then the other part is, um, you know, we're lucky enough that we are backed by the Irish government and they have um, already released up to 1 billion in supports for companies. So key to that is making sure that, um, you know, liquidity, there is, um, there is a source of funds there for our companies. Okay, what about you, Chris? Well, I mean, <clears throat> you know, frankly, times have changed dramatically, right? I mean, when, when startups are evaluating their risk profile, you know, they evaluate product market fit, they evaluate operational risk and complexity, and they evaluate financial risk. And, and suddenly, the, you know, the, the financial risk metric has gone through the roof. And, and if, if young companies are in a position where they need to find funding uh, at this time, uh, that's an incredibly dangerous and difficult place to be. So much of our energy has been about, uh, you know, managing the capital stack and managing the balance sheet. Do you have money to get into 2021 uh, and preferably be at a place where, you know, relevance is, is, uh, is there coming out of the crisis and, and burn rate is low. So, you know, at least initially, I think all hands on deck to, to reduce cost and get control of your own destiny. And, and maybe more, I, I know government has been a large role, both here in the U.S. and, and across the globe. So maybe tell us about, maybe some more details about how, both of you, but more in particular, coming from the Irish government, what role does government have in helping companies bridge that, that liquidity gap and, and how to best work with them? Yeah, well, one of the key things for, for us in Ireland is, you know, just having a large fund where our companies can access that, that, that money. Um, and, and especially if you think of companies that are more affected, that we have that pot there that they can access just to get them through this period. And also, you know, it's really unclear how long this will last. So making sure there is enough money to, you know, to, so they can sustain in the long term. So that's really key for us. Um, so definitely more of a focus on making sure that they can continue to, to grow and thrive. Um, and, and, and really looking as well at what are the most promising companies and to do that. Okay. So I had a slide I wanted to call, call for as a bit of a, a talking point. This is some data we just put together about the amount of venture capital raised in travel. And last year, 2019, was a record year. And it felt real good. And we're, we're on top. Here we go. And that's obviously not going to be the case um, this year, right? It's going to be a tough environment. So... I kind of wanted to, to discuss sort of what, um, you know, when will venture capital return to the travel industry? When, uh, maybe Chris, you have, you have some insights on this. When will companies, when will investors start putting money back to work in travel? And is now a good time to be invested in travel? Well, I mean, I think investors are fatigued by valuations, right? I mean, so you have a little, there's a number of forces that are pl at play here. Um, I, I think that there is generally an attitude of waiting this out until there's some clarity of what's coming. Um, there's definitely a collective interest in seeing rational valuations back on the table for early stage investors. But I don't think that necessarily people are spooked away from travel completely, especially, you know, people who are investing in, in business to business technologies and companies are, are, are finding some opportunities and are seeing, you know, opportunities going forward. You know, one of the things I think we, we suffered from in, in 2019 is a lot of the, of the suppliers that we work with, a lot of the incumbents in the industry were, you know, in many ways just thriving so much that they, they had no reason to focus on experimentation and innovation. Right, so sort of this general attitude, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So it was more and more difficult for companies that were focused on productivity to penetrate uh, major suppliers. That has dramatically changed. You know, suddenly the, the dust has been blown off the two year study, right? The, the committee that was formed to study innovation over the next two years and decide what to do because Revpar in the hotel industry in particular has plummeted. So now all of a sudden it's all hands on deck. You've got software that helps us be more efficient. You've got ideas around in, you know, automation and so forth. Um, we're in. Now, 
when that actually turns on and companies start to engage, that's the thing that we don't know. So I think there are, there are a lot of investors right now, at least in the, over the last four weeks, that have just completely shut off uh, uh, funding. Um, my sense is that that is beginning to change and people are starting to lean forward a bit. Uh, and as soon as we have some clarity about when the, the lock is gonna come off of travel more generally, and, and frankly, just you know, people getting together, I think that you're gonna see some activity. What about, what about you, Maura? Are you, are you seeing the same thing in terms of capital getting deployed? Yeah, I would say, yeah, very much so. And I, and I think, you know, even if I think of Enterprise Ireland, it's not that we have stopped um, investment committee meetings. It's, you know, probably right now more of the focus is on existing companies. But I do think, to Chris's point, you know, there has been several players in the industry that have been kind of very slow to move. And this will actually, I think, really push innovation along you know, at a quicker at a quicker rate, and in turn, that will help. You know, there will be more funding that will come in because um, we no longer can have these committees that take two years. You know, I think if if there wasn't those committees, there would have been more innovative solutions in place already, and many of the players would not have been as effective. Um, you know, and I, and I think sometimes. Um, there is fear within industries, and I think sometimes there's a lot of fear in travel to innovate. You know, and even, you know, we've been talk talking about personalization for so many years, but really how many companies have really taken that baton and have actually, you know, really done personalization really well. So um, I, I think actually this will cause the industry to innovate further, and, th and that will trickle down into more opportunities for startups, and, and more investors being over, like, interested in the industry because it still has to go through radical transformation. Okay, so let's, let's maybe move a little forward. Let's be a little forward looking. I've got another one more slide. It's the last one. And it was something that we did. And I was just making this point that there were some really incredible companies founded in the last, in the last recession. Airbnb, Get Your Guide, who's speaking shortly. And I think they succeeded because they... They saw that things were changing. They tapped into something really powerful. Case of Airbnb, it was people are frugal. People want local connections. So we're saying this is going to jumpstart innovation. We're saying there's dry powder on the sidelines. <clears throat> what, what, is, what are the new trends? What's the next Airbnb? What's the next Get Your Guide that you guys are going to be looking for? <laughs> that's asking a lot. I know. Man, if, big we, if we knew. <laughs> that's what you get paid the big bucks for. You know, right yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> um, you know... <laughs> It's really hard to say. I mean, there's some really interesting shifts happening in accommodations. And I, I think you've seen some things written about it. Some of the, uh, you know, one of our companies, Sonder, um, is seeing um, less of a downturn in, in, in their occupancy and, and their rev par indexes in cities than many of the competitive hotels in the space for a number of obvious reasons. Um, they're seeing a lot more local travel. So people who are, you know, just basically tired of being cooped up at home or are renting uh, Sonder assets and, and staying there for a few days using those offices and so forth. Frontline workers are using them. So I, there's an interesting play in how accommodations are going to shift. And I continue to believe that the alternative assets are, gonna, are going to thrive. Um, there's a great deal of pressure on the traditional hospitality model, specifically the labor intensity of traditional hospitality. So you see some you know, new operators who have innovated around, around the space, including Lifehouse Hotels, which is another one of our portfolio companies. Um, I think that that's going to be very interesting. I think the, the traditional model of the way hotels operate, I mean, think about how you walk into a hotel and it's like a bank teller desk with a bunch of employees just standing there waiting to check you in. That's an incredibly heavy cost burden on the operations of hotels and, and there's also so much happening in the back office of hotels with night audits and, you know, and so forth, just for reporting to ownership. A lot of that is changing. And I think there'll, there'll be some very interesting innovations going forward in, in, in the space there as well. Um, but picking out the next big play, that's difficult to do. And, and, I, and I also think that some of the major mega home runs, if you look at them, are mostly are consumer focused 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the top of the travel funnel, I still contend, is incredibly complicated. And certainly coming out of this recovery, the, that battle zone at the top of the travel funnel is just going to get that much more intense, right? Every major OTA, you know, intermediary is going to be, you know, full guns trying to get their share of what will be a smaller pie. Meanwhile, suppliers are going to be desperately trying to get direct bookings. They always have, but even more so now because of the pressure on margins. Um, so it's just going to be really difficult, I think, to build anything, you know, novel in the, in the top of the travel funnel. So you're looking at more B2B, yeah, more tech, yeah. and more backing. I think that's where the opportunities are going to continue to be. Um, uh, you know, I think that there's, you know, there's been some clear evidence in our case where suppliers are coming to us um, and looking for, you know, uh, innovations that help um, drive productivity and, and reduce cost. I think that's a, a, a very, still continues to be a very interesting, interesting category and interesting area. And I want to, I want to get your take too, Maura, in terms of what sectors, you know, what trends uh, you are really eager to, to, to take a look at companies in that sector. So I think the one interesting thing as well that, that I think people should not forget about if we even look at companies like Airbnb and even Instagram and Twitter, they all actually did a pivot when they started. And I think for all the startups that are on this call, you know, I think asking, you know, the question, is this the business I'm meant to be in? And um, can my product be tweaked? And one, one really good example, for example, that, that we have invested in is a company called Mana Drone Delivery. And they were meant to launch, you know, in the last, in the last week doing um, takeaway deliveries, like food takeaway. And they've pivoted to now offer urgent medical supplies. Um, it doesn't mean to say that they're going to do that, you know, indefinitely. But I, I think, you know, I would just encourage people to really look at what they're doing. Um, and, and is there another opportunity there? Um, I think for us and, and for our investment team in particular, there's a lot of focus. Yes, there's a focus on travel, but also obviously we um, invest in many different types of companies. So I would say FinTech. Um, MedTech, digital health, they're all super important now. So if we look at what is happening in the world and, and even how some of these other verticals can impact travel. And I think, for example, you know, obviously FinTech and MedTech, both of those would have a positive impact. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, right now there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, anytime, I think when it comes to travel, when you can, increase productivity, efficiencies, and ultimately create more revenue streams. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm still shocked that hotels have really not tapped into ancillary like airlines. Um, you know, those opportunities are still there. Yeah, so, I totally agree. I, I, I just, I want to add because yeah, I think please. that business travel is a really interesting category, right? I, I, I I absolutely fundamentally do not believe that we are going to come out of this a Zoom culture. I mean, the reality is there will always be a number two, three, four, and five competitor who's going to get on an airplane and have a face-to-face -face meeting. And as soon as that yeah. happens, then the number one player is going to have to do it. And business travel is going to come storming back. Meetings are going to come storming back. Because frankly, if you think about it, you know, the fear here is binary. It's a fear of death, right? And so once that's eliminated, through either a vaccine or treatment or just fundamentally people's psychology changes about this because the media moves on and focuses on other things once we've kind of come out the other side, business travel is going to come storming back. Now, the imperative is it's going to have to be digitized, right? The analog way of meetings and business travel is just not going to function properly in a post-corona world. People aren't going to feel like they're practicing true duty of care. So I think that there's going to be a lot of really interesting innovation around group business and meeting uh, coming out of this. Oh, well, that's a great take. And it's a good thought. I, we, we're running short on time. I want to ask one more question. And I want to ask a bit of a practical question for all the, the startup founders on the, the call. So are you still taking pitch meetings? I've heard that, you know, VCs, they really want to have those face-to-face -face meetings. Are you taking Zoom pitch meetings? And when you take a pitch meeting, um, what do you, other, aside from the obvious, having cash, what are you looking for? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to jump in first. So, yeah. 
Yes, absolutely taking meetings. Absolutely, we're still investing. We're, you know, we're leaning in and, and, and taking a, a, you know, an aggressive approach out there. We, we haven't written any checks in the last several weeks, except for to our own companies. Um, but we do take meetings. And you know, what we're looking for, I think, from the, the, the prior interview was it clearly relevance, right? I mean, you're, you're looking for companies, at least for us, that, that are really focused on on problems that need to be solved now and in 2021. So, you know, for us, it's a combination of, of, of efficiency, cost management. Obviously, we're not going to invest in a company that's got a very high burn rate and is going to require, you know, tons of capital to flow into it to be successful because we're just not living in that kind of an environment, but very much taking pitches now. And, and more so I would, you, I'll, I'll give you the yeah. last word because you weren't skipped yellow. So you, you get, you get that. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say um, one thing to keep in mind is core to who inv we invest in is Irish companies. So you have to be based in Ireland, even though we have a, a thriving travel technology scene. Um, and yes, our, we have a whole team of people who uh, continuously listen to pitches. Um, I, I do think, you know, when you are doing that, some important um, tips is having a really deep understanding of the problem that you are trying to solve. You know, what is your unique selling proposition? Um, and obviously what's really key is having core tech. Um, you know, we have very stringent um, guidelines that we follow and some of them really is around the tech stack that you have. Um, and of course, founding team is always important. And if you've had experience in a startup before, that's always a positive. I'm actually being told I have time for one more question, so I was preemptive there. Still, thank you for answering yellow, but I wanted to talk a bit, really now looking forward, about exit opportunities. Are you guys think that there's still the ability for startup for startup exits in this environment, or will that have to wait? And and we'll we'll do the same order, Chris, and then and then Maura again. In this environment right now, I mean, the only exit opportunities right now are basically just to tape up the boxes and go home. No, I don't. I, I don't see any. Certainly no upside exits, maybe some salvage exits or, you know, but no, this is, this is not a time to go to market, uh, nor is it a time to raise money. Okay. Okay. More same, same from you or, or a different approach here? Or yeah, I, I think it's similar. I, I really think, um, you know, in the travel space, it's probably not the time. Um, in other spaces, um, things, are, things are still happening. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I think I think I'll I'll um I'll end it there. Um, but thank you so much for for joining us, both of you. Appreciate you taking the time to to hop on on Zoom with me. Sure, my pleasure. pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Moore. Uh, before we go into our next discussion, uh, I'm launched another audience poll, which many of you are voting on. Um, have you participated in recent digital travel experiences, virtual travel experiences? Uh, please vote and then I will share uh, those results during this next discussion. And now we have an interview on the recent changes on uh, around the virus and considering changes to the product roadmap uh, to meet travelers needs right now. Uh, leading this conversation will be uh, senior travel tech editor, Sean O'Neill, in conversation with the CEO, a COO, excuse me, of Get Your Guide, Tao Tao. Hello. Uh, so, uh, Tao, thank you for joining us from Berlin. Um, hey, Sean, how are you doing? And thanks for the promotion. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, so, we'll just get right into it. Get Your Guide is an online travel agency focusing on the tourism activities sector, uh, including sightseeing and experiences. Uh, and that sector has seen sort of a nuclear winter right now. Um, but Get Your Guide has responded very quickly to this uh, crisis, more quickly than a lot of travel companies, frankly, across sectors. So could you tell us a bit about how your, uh, your company has sort of responded to this great lockdown recession? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thanks, thanks for having me and thanks for uh, allowing me to share maybe some of the learnings that might be uh, helpful for some, some other travel companies. So, um, you know, one, one of the um, things that we saw very early is because we have um, a major part in, in, in Asia uh, and we saw the, the signs very, very early. So we could see very early on that this is going to be something that will hit Europe um, and that will hit our employees. 
And so we already had some contingency plans in the drawers. And everything was built around being there for our partners, being there for employees. Um, and so, you know, being there and, and, you know, we put the plans into action. And so the first thing we did was that we, um, we were the first company probably in Germany um, that moved our global workforce to, to work from home, uh, making sure that the health and safety of our employees is guaranteed. Um, we, I think, were the first company that implemented a, a complete free cancellation policy uh, already in, in March 1st or March 2nd which means that, you know, customers want to cancel, uh, they can do that and we, you know, we cover it. Um, and, and we did that working with our supply partners because, you know, our supply partners were very understanding that, you know, this is now a crisis uh, that's unprecedented. Um, and then we want to be there for our travel community and, and making that happen. So um, just a lot of incredible, I would say culture coming to, coming to light uh, in the company of people taking ownership um, and just making things happen very, very quickly. Cool. Well, you mentioned your partners are one of your priorities. So how have you been trying to sort of engage with your partners, you know, the tour operator community? This is this has been quite a, a challenging time with revenue going down to zero in some cases. Yeah, it's been I think it's in, in, incredibly difficult. And, you know, I've been on, on a few calls um, with suppliers. Um, we you know, did, did some Q&A's with the suppliers. You know, this is super hard, right, because, um, you know, no revenue. Um, a lot of good tour guides, um, you know, are, are out of work. Uh, I think it's super, super difficult for them. And I think we have to accept that, uh, you know, what can we change and what can we not change, right? There's this famous saying of, you know, accept the things you, you cannot change and have the courage to do the things you can change. And so what we are doing is, um, you know, trying to be there for our customers, listen to them, give them advice. So for example, we, we put up a site where our supply partners can look up you know, where to apply for government funding, at least to the best of knowledge that we know. Um, we are um, moving, uh, you know, we have a lot of webinars that we're hosting uh, regionally as well as internationally giving advice. Um, but really most of our effort is on the recovery. So our strategy here is really, you know, we all believe that travel will come back. I think that's a fact. We just don't know when uh, and in what shape, whether it's more domestic, whether it's more international, but we know recovery will happen. And so we are focusing our efforts on recovery, which means when recovery takes place, we're moving our payments to bi-monthly, which means that suppliers get more liquidity faster um, and doing a lot of other things that we're brainstorming right now of how can we hypercharge the recovery so that, you know, as our supply partners hibernate in this nuclear winter of travel, when they come back, how we can come back in full force. That makes sense about adding some more uh, flexibility for suppliers and some of those other measures you mentioned. Uh, are you adjusting your product roadmap in 2020? Uh, full force ahead. I think what was true before the crisis will, uh, for the most part, hold true after the crisis. Um, you know, you, you, you guys mentioned that you get, you're having a poll on virtual tours. Uh, we're big fans. We have some of those. But at the very core, what we do know is people will travel again, right? If, if there's one thing that we know is people will travel, they want the real thing, they want to see it, they want to smell it, they want to see it in 3D, they want to touch it, except for the artifacts. Um, and, and so you want to see the real thing. And our investments right now go into how do we make that even better uh, when travel comes back. So we're investing heavily into our technology platforms. We're investing heavily into our products and so making it even easier to discover great experiences uh, and we're investing more into our supply offerings. So, you know, our sales teams are busier than ever, you know, working out deals with suppliers, with attractions around the world, um, getting ready for recovery and, and really just, you know, waiting how we can launch more uh, originals and how can we launch even more incredible tours around the world. So the poll that we had of, with our, of our attendees here in the SCIF Summit showed that about 42-ish percent uh, hadn't tried a virtual tour, but they were interested. It's still a new product for a lot of people. What's your guess, Tao, about whether this is just sort of a stopgap product, or do you think that this is going to be the idea of virtual or digital tours being something that will be in your menu of offerings for some time to come? Yeah, I, I you know, we, we launched a brand campaign, um, The World at Home, um, uh, three weeks ago, across our social media channels, where we are providing um, you know, working with local partners to provide, for example, cooking classes with Francisco, who's, who's running a cooking class in Florence. Uh, we had a drag queen uh, have a session, she, she, you know, he or she is giving um, uh, the, the, the drag tours here in Berlin. So really, really, really fun tours that we're giving for free. Um, and, you know, we're doing that to inspire customers, reminding them of the joy and beauty of travel. 
I do not think that it is a replacement for the real thing. Um, you know, personally, I'm stuck at home. I've been trying to watch some of these virtual tours myself. I watched some travel documentaries. But if there's one thing all these things did is to actually, you know, make the itch for travel even worse. Um, you know, I, I saw some, you know, I'm a foodie. So I saw some a travel documentary about food. And, you know, just instinctively, you, you grab a computer and search for flights. And then you realize, okay, cannot fly to Taiwan right now to go to the food market. So... <laughs> I think I think it's just I think we just gotta we just gotta you know bunker uh, hunker down and and sit it out. Um, no, but we we firmly believe in the real thing and we're investing into the real thing. Okay. Um, so Azim of Exponential View was chatting with Rafat a little earlier, and he was saying that uh, you know things will bounce back in the global economy, but there may be structurally different consumer behaviors. Uh, and th there might be less long haul travel for you know up to two years or so. There may be much less consumer spending. Some of the emotional buttons that consumers are looking for when they're seeking experiences may shift as well. What what's your take? Do you believe that? Have a different view? I look. I think I think this is a, <laughs> this is the, the the biggest thing that travel has ever seen in in its entire history. So we are in uncharted territory and anyone claiming to know exactly what will happen, when it will happen, will be wrong, right? I mean, there's a saying that um, the last seven recessions, uh, none of them were predicted by economists. And I think it's the same for the travel recovery and when it will take place, how it will take place. I think all of these things we don't know. Um, you know, we're learning and I think it's about adapting very, very quickly. So we're already doing a few things. Um, so working with attractions on, so we know that customers want, don't want to send in queues. We know that customers um, have new hygiene standards they want to adhere to. So working with our supply partners to bring them to life, uh, to give customers more confidence to book again. Um, so we're doing all these things, but I think I don't think there's a silver bullet. And it's only in retrospect where we will see, okay, these were the key things that made the recovery faster. But I think right now should be trying a bunch of things and see which ones work. Okay. So you referred to the Get Your Guide Originals product. Some people may not know what that is. And does that have to, you know, do you ramp that up? Do you dial that back given the, the, the uh, this uncertainty of 2020? Yeah. So, so Get Your Guide Originals, um, for those who are not familiar, is really um, our end-to-end -end experience where we work with uh, local tour guides or local supply partners to create incredible end-to-end -end offerings and tap into the Get Your Guide brand. So, you know, customers know and love Get Your Guide, um, and we combine that with incredible offerings of our local partners to create even better experiences. So, for example, we have this incredible um, supply partner in, um, in Bali, where he did incredible tours to the gates of heaven, uh, for example, where you can, you know, you stand in the middle, you take these Instagram pictures, and we talked about, hey, how can we make this an even better experience um, for example, focusing on Instagram spots. And so together we co-created a Get Your Guide original um, kind of best of Instagram scenic spots tour, which is now one of the best selling tours in all of Asia uh, across any platform. And so that's really the vision of Get Your Guide, which is using our data insights to bring to life incredible end-to-end -end experiences with our local partners by tapping into the Get Your Guide brand. And we're doubling down on this because we believe that more than ever, um, defining the end-to-end -end experience, especially in a world where people need confidence and trust that things work out will be more important than ever. So uh, we're a firm believer and we're investing heavily into this uh, area. And so just to tease that out, the application to other sectors might be that in, in, given uncertainty, there may be a new emphasis on soft brands, branding and standardization and travel product may you know, become a, a more important trend coming forward. Um, how, how has Get Your Guide been doing sort of financially? You know, are you able to withstand this crisis? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, f I think it was shown on the on the slide from an earlier uh, session that we were born in a financial crisis. So we were born in 2008 when we were a student project. Uh, so we're really old timers here, really. Um, and, and we bootstrapped the business for three years without raising a Series A until 2012. Um, and so, so we know what it's like to be disciplined. Um, and this have, have been operating the company. So we were never a company of excess. And so what we also did now is to uh, trim especially the marketing expenditures, trim some of the, uh, the variable cost, um, and, and making sure that we don't have to lay anyone off, right? So we are committed to protecting the, uh, the people because the people that we have today will be the ones to drive the recovery uh, when it takes place. And, and so for us, um, it's really that we're fortunate that we are well capitalized. Um, we raised around last year. Um, I would say more lucky than genius, um, but you know, we, we, we take it, so we're very blessed in that regard.
but sure, even we, you know, um, I think one thing that we always tell uh, internally is your biggest investor are your customers, right? They are the ones who give you uh, the bookings and that is the revenue that should fund the business. And so our biggest investor is on hiatus. And, and so we're waiting for them to come back to really fuel the business again when recovery hits. Okay. So uh, Tal, one thing that came up in the conversation earlier between Chris Hemeter of Thayer Ventures and Moira Walsh from Enterprise Ireland is that uh, they're thinking that the top of the funnel, the transaction funnel, uh, will get very intense after the crisis. Um, what, what, is your, what is your take on that? Because in a certain sense, as an online travel agency, you know, that, that it's an area where you play. I think, you know, I think customers in, especially in times of crises, um, the brand is more important than ever. And the brand is not what you, what you say, it's but what you do. So I believe that A, um, you know, our loyal customers will remember the things that we have done around cancellation flexibility, about being there for them during this crisis. Uh, same for our supply partners. So I think that is the, really the core of any business. Um, you know, when it comes to upper funnel, I, I believe what will happen is certainly an acceleration to digital. I mean, that is a trend that you're going to see in retail, in, in groceries. Um, so I think it will be uh, probably a net positive overall for, um, for, for OTAs in general. Um, but I also think that we will have what will change is local demand, right? There will be a lot more weekend trips. There will be a lot more domestic trips. Um, I think in Europe, you will probably, and this is all, you know, guessing at this point, you'll probably first have internal uh, uh, travel restriction lifted. Then you will start to have regional restrictions lifted. So p folks, you know, in Germany can go to France and French can go to Italy. Um, and that is where we're going to be focusing our recovery efforts on. Okay. Um, one of the other topics that came up is that, you know, B to uh, B startups may uh, struggle a bit, uh, excuse me, may do better than B to C startups, ones that are trying to be founded now and today. As you said, you were founded, in, you know, sort of the crisis around 2008, 2009. What's your take on the whole B to C to B to B debate? Do, has things fundamentally changed and so the odds are much harder at the, at the consumer side? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it's always been hard for startups to break into the mold. It took us, you know, 10 years until we were an overnight success. And, you know, I don't think it will get harder or easier for startups to, you know, to, to disrupt the incumbents. That, that's always been hard. Um, that said, I think it is a common theme that generally uh, some of the best companies are either built or rebuilt uh, during a crisis. And I think that will hold true for both B2C and B2B. Um, I, I'm not a B2B expert, um, but I, I know uh, I'm very confident. This is maybe just my naive belief, but I'm very confident that leisure travel will come back in full force. People have an intrinsic need, an innate desire to travel, and that will not change. And it, more than ever, people are probably realizing that, oh, the conversations with my, with my wife or husband are much more convenient, uh, much more pleasant under a palm tree uh, or, or on a desert safari than, you know, in my... 30 square meter apartment. And I think that is a truth that a lot of people are discovering. And I think that will hold true after the crisis as well. well I'd like to wrap up with one question. So we've gotten a, a several uh, messages in from the attendees and one sort of theme is sort of this question about will virtual experiences, how durable they are. You, you talked a, a bit about this. Is, is your, I guess a two part question. Do you, do you see early signs that people really are paying for these experiences? And B, do you feel like there's anything more broadly in the digital experience about how consumers use digital tools on the spectrum of doing experiences that you think is changing as a result of the crisis? Yeah, I mean, my, my personal advice that I you know, try to give to startups is, is have a strategy and strategies about knowing where to play and how you win. Um, you know, if you play in the digital space, the competition is Netflix, Disney, the PlayStation, uh, Masterclass, <laughs> uh, and all the other things, right? It's, it's um, focus on what are the jobs to be done. The jobs to be done at home is entertainment on the couch, uh, maybe some learning. The job to be done when you travel is a fundamentally different one. So look, if you have conviction about travel, if you have conviction in your core product, hunker down, build an incredible products, because people will come back and people will travel. And then the one with the best product and the best brand uh, and the best service will win. That has been true in any crisis. Um, and look, I'm not a virologist, my co-founder is, but from everything I know, this is not the end of the world. People will travel again. We just gotta you know, toughen it out until then and, and, and there will be a tomorrow. And, and those that do survive and do come out with a better product will emerge extremely strong for the next 10 to 20 years. 
well, that's a great note to finish on. And there's been a lot of audience chat from our attendees that we see people have been really enjoying this presentation. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us, Tao, and stay safe. Thank you, Sean. See you next time, hopefully in person. Definitely. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to Tao and to Sean. Uh, before we move on to our next discussion, uh, I am going to launch another poll. Uh, so here we go. Do you think B2B startups are more or less resilient than B2C? Um, so this speaking to Sean's point there uh, earlier in the discussion. Uh, we're gonna hold one second before we join. So just bear with us one moment. And of course, if you need to use the restroom or step away, you're more welcome to do that. We'll be joining back again with these discussions in about two minutes. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. And now we will move into our panel discussion uh, on startup founders building resilience and preparing for the future. Uh, this conversation will feature the CEO and founder of Peak, who's one of us here, and the CEO and founder of Freebird, Ethan Bernstein. Uh, please, uh, moderating this discussion will be, uh, again, Sean O'Neill. Please join me in welcoming everyone to this discussion. Hello, Roswana and Ethan. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's just dive in there. Um, Roswana, uh, Peak's uh, flagship product is helping, uh, uh, is providing software to tour operators to enable them to run their businesses. Um, and, um, you know, you have, uh, when we were chatting last week, uh, you said that all travel startups right now should have as top priorities, you know, survival and adding value. Uh, so could you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what does it mean, you know, uh, how Peak is approaching survival and how it is adding value? Yeah, so I think, I think um, you know, big thing for us has been, A, um, making sure that um, we really focus on, in, on the COVID crisis and acknowledge just how unusual this is um, and, you know, change our operations on a day-to-day -day basis and change what we're actually you know, focusing for our businesses as well. And so to make it through the crisis, our, you know, our leadership team, we've entirely changed the way that we operate. Um, so we have daily scrums and we have a task force around COVID led by um, one of our VPs on our founding team um, and weekly communication with the entire team um, via all hands meetings and things like that, um, you know, so that we can continually inform ourselves about what changes are happening and then therefore what changes we can make through the organization in order to help our merchants. Um, you know, the big things for us in terms of adding value to operators is that we work mainly with small businesses that do tours and activities. So people who might be doing a zip lining business or a boat tour. And what's really important in this phase is that with, with the quarantine, people can't go outside, they can't book experiences. And so um, we've been helping our operators to secure government assistance with the PPP loans. So we um, partnered uh, with Wampley in order to actually be able to serve them and give them fast track access to PPP. Um, we've also given them guidance around um, the economic uh, disaster injury loans and things like that. And so, you know, really what we've been doing is, is it focusing on what is the most value we can add um, for businesses and the applications have been huge. And we've, we've um, you know, we've helped 
processed thousands of applications for our operators now um, in order to help them um, get access to these loans. So, um, you know, that's been uh, a big focus for us with things like webinars and, um, and, and, and really just tools in order to enable people. So with, even within our product, we've helped our operators to be able to um, very easily convert bookings into gift cards um, or to be able to change, um, you know, change, change up, you know, um, for their SBA loan reporting, be able to show what the impact has been um, because they can see year over year reporting from Peak Pro. So those have been the things we've focused on. Well, that's great. So that really helps to understand. So tactically, you know, things like the pace of meetings internally in order to make sure everyone is uh, sort of on the same page, getting up-to-date information, a changed rhythm. And then also about, you, you mentioned several U.S.-based loan programs and, and sort of assistance or small businesses sort of communicating how to, to help that. Um, so Ethan, you know, Freebird is a company that helps travelers when their flights have been disrupted uh, to be able to rebook on any airline at no cost. Um, so how has this uh, crisis sort of like either, you know, affected your company? Has it validated the general mission or has it been a, a once in a hundred year situation that doesn't really uh, have to do with what you do? Yeah. Well, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me, Sean. Uh, I can't imagine a time where the stress and anxiety of travelers were higher than right now. And so in terms of our mission, you know, most people don't know this, but we actually have two missions. The first is to help reduce the uncertainty and impact of flight disruptions for travelers. The other is to improve their lived experience, which means if they're experiencing fear, uncertainty, doubt about what's going to happen to them, whether it's a weather pattern or whether it's a pandemic, we're there to actually support their needs and help them have a better experience through the process. So if anything, this has validated what we've thought all along, which is that there is a need out there um, to help provide better information, better assistance, better support, and better technology to travelers when they don't know what's going on, they don't know what they should be doing, they need help. Um, and we've actually been there for folks um, throughout this, providing real-time information, uh, the latest and greatest of refund policies and impacts to flights. Airlines are disrupting flights well in advance. Um, as they consolidate passengers on a single aircraft. So, you know, if ever there was a need for somebody being your guardian angel and watching out for you and making sure you have the right information, now's that time. That's great. I, I think what you just said, Ethan, sort of resonates with what Roswana was saying, because there's, there's sort of a need to be empathetic right now, you know, listening and being in touch with where your partners are, because I think there are some tech vendors out there that are kind of doing text explaining where they're sort of like just sort of giving advice that isn't really connected to the space where you know uh, uh, tour operators are mentally right now um so I, I, Rezwan, i wanted to go back you sort of alluded about adding value and so some of the things that you talked about was sort of like helping people uh, yeah tour operators and in having their loans understanding services is there anything else than sort of like you know credit charge backs or other tools that you've been sort of trying to offer yeah, I mean, I think that what we've been trying to do is make sure that, you know, on a day to day basis, we're thinking about what the next needs are for the businesses that we work with. And so, you know, just as you know, right now, it, it isn't really traditionally we're a software business. We have, you know, Peak Pro, which is booking tools for our tour operators and it's um, you know, pretty sophisticated tools for them to run their business. But today there aren't that many bookings coming in. Most pretty much every business we're working with isn't getting new bookings right now. And so it, it's really important in that period to be kind of recognized that they've taken an immense hit. Um, you know, there are not going to be any bookings coming through. And there are surveys that estimate um, that as high as kind of 40% of tour operators, you know, are worried that, that they're going to be forced to shut down if they, if they don't get through the next three months, um, if there are no bookings. And so um, it's really important in that period to say, okay, well, you know, our mission is to help the world um, connect the world through experiences. That's only possible if there are incredible vendors that we work with um, who are able to offer those experiences to consumers. And so, um, you know, the, the focus for us has been around around these things. And on each day, there are new ways in which we can add value. And so I mentioned something like, you know, some of our operators have started doing kind of virtual tours or, um, you know, people have decided that the, the best way that they can kind of try and bring income in is to sell gift cards so that people can support them.
our local businesses, or even if somebody wants a refund, to, to educate that consumer that, that actually it would be better for them to take a gift card um, because that actually helps support that local business in this time of need. And so we've been giving them a lot of guidance around that. We have a whole COVID hub, um, which is a full of resources with articles, videos, webinars. We're doing our own webinars and panels. And in fact, um, last week we had a webinar um, just on the PPP loan application process, like all the questions you might have through that. And hundreds of operators joined that. We had about 600 people sign up um, for that, that webinar. And so, you know, what we see is that there's lots of value you can add um, just around education and the, the small things that they can do in order to preserve capital and cash um, in order to get through the next few months, because we think that the next few months are going to be very challenging and very tough for the tours and activities business. Yeah, so Rose, why not you talk about education? So one thing when we talk on the phone, you mentioned sort of like the domestic rebound. You you mentioned sort of this concept that, you know, it for countries and markets that had a lot of out market travel, now those people may be staying at home when travel rebounds. So what could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, of course. So, you know, really um after SARS, um, which is obviously very, quite different in terms of its impact, but um a similar kind of situation, what you found was that in the US um, people stopped traveling internationally as much and there was a domestic substitution effect. And so what happened is that more people ended up um, booking things locally and traveling locally. And so when you look at a business like ours, what we recognize is that, um, you know, about on average, just generally about 35% of our bookings happen with locals. They're local people who are kind of, you know, in their local market, they're taking their kids horse riding, they're going to an escape room and they're learning, a, you know, to cook at a cooking class, right? And so what we see is that, you know, not only do you think, you know, as we get through this, um, on the other end, I think, frankly, many more people are going to have been stuck in their homes for a couple of months, and they're going to desperately want to go out and do things, um, especially with families and kids. And so I think that, um, you know, most of the businesses we work with provide quite small experiences. So it's, you know, about 10 ish people um, doing a walking tour or doing a cooking class, they're not large things. And so we think that the businesses um, that kind of, you know, buckle down and get through these kind of hard couple of uh, few months that are coming up, actually can have a rebound where's, where the domestic substitution effect means that more people are doing experiences um, in, in America. Um, and actually, I think you'll have more of a local substitution effect as well as, as people don't want to go uh, on trips. They, won't, they don't want to go necessarily on a plane anymore, um, but they, they are willing to go out and do things a few hours away from their home and find fun things to do. And, and the really you know cool thing about the States is there's tons of nature and really great local experiences that people can participate in that are also quite small. You don't have to go to a big attraction anymore. There are incredible experiences at your door that, that great operators have created that you can do. So we definitely feel that there's going to be a big rebound. It's just a matter of being resilient enough to get through the next few months. That makes logical sense. Um, so we had an audience, a poll, uh, and attendees of this SCIF Summit sort of gave their, you know, some of their opinions about uh, virtual or digital experiences. Uh, and we've also had a poll about B2B travel versus B2C uh, travel. And uh, both of your businesses have like, you've played around with B2C a bit, but you're primarily in the business to business side. Uh, people thought that uh, B2, B businesses were more resilient generally. Ethan, what is, what is your take having seen all of this uh, on that issue of B2B versus B2C? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ink spilled on this, Sean. And, um, I'm not an expert, uh, I don't teach the class on B2B versus B2C, um, but the way that I think about it right now is everybody's talking about cash is king. You know, every question I get from an investor, from an advisor, from our partners is, you know, how long is your runway? How long will you survive? So when you think about survival and you think about it through that framework, the resilience of a business is really just comes down to how much money are you making and when do you actually see that money coming into your bank account? And how quickly are you spending that money um, on your headcount and on operating expenses and on variable expenses? Uh, and so when I think about B2B generally, you know, in that type of environment, it's really about the strength of your partnerships. Are your partners going to stand with you? Are they going to continue to bring you volume? Are they going to continue to pay you? And for our business, um, we've actually done a great job over the last couple of years of diversifying the types of B2B relationships that we have. So on the one hand, we have volume-based relationships where the more volume that they provide to us, the more we get paid and the less volume, the less we get paid. And of course, as you can imagine, with air travel being down with many partners, you know, 90, 95, 
plus percent year over year, those relationships have gone pretty much to zero. The other type of relationship that we've, we've built out as well is one that's more on a rolling quarterly basis with more of a fixed amount of spend. And those have actually been quite resilient for us and we're investing even more heavily in those types of relationships in this environment. And so I, I know not all B2B businesses are able to have both, um, some are. Um, in this particular instance, we just happened to benefit from the fact that we had diversified into both and now we're able to lean into those uh, time-based partnerships rather than volume-based partnerships. Do you, do you feel, Ethan, that Freebird is in a pretty good position uh, for this crisis? You know, we heard earlier from Azim that it might might go on, it'd be disruptive for, you know, a year, year and a half or longer. Um, how is Freebird sort of positioned? Well, here's the real answer. Is, is anybody in travel in a good position right now? I mean, I don't think anyone is. There's a lot of pain uh, out there. You know, just look around. Unicorns are firing half their staff. Um, it's pretty bad out there. For us, given the relationships that we have, um, given the product that we have in market, we actually are in a decent position. That doesn't mean that we're going to be able to weather the storm no matter what the storm brings. Um, once we get into the latter half of this year, if there's a prolonged recession or depression, or if travel takes a long time to bounce back, we're going to be hurting just like everybody else. Um, but for now, we did have a, a small headcount reduction. We let go about 20% of our company, which was heartbreaking. But we've also put ourselves in a position where um, if things continue in neutral um, status quo, we have the ability to survive well into 2021. And if things are really, really bad, you know, we might have to take additional steps, but we still have the ability to survive through the end of next year. So the, the advice that we're getting from most of our investors um, and advisors are if you don't have at least 18 months of cash under the worst possible scenario, which for us and many other travel companies is zero dollars of revenue. If you don't have at least 18 months, you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position where you're essentially betting your company on a macroeconomic trend. Um, and for folks that are really early stage, you know, we've talked about this, uh, you know, other people talked about this on the call. You know, if you're just starting your business out, um, it's actually really fertile manure to, to build uh, an innovative solution in. But if you have a lot of employees and you have a lot of top line revenue um, and you've really you know, put your blood, sweat and tears into something, are you willing to bet your company um, and everything that you've done on a macroeconomic trend? So that, I mean, that's the really, the really tough question to answer. Right. And so, you know, here, Roswana, here at Skift, you know, we've, we've also faced these tough decisions about revenue. You know, we've had to have some, a mix of furloughs and other measures. Uh, how is it that you've had to make the tough calls at peak? Yeah, similar to Ethan, we, we had to make similar kind of small reductions in force in a, a similar way. And, and, and I completely agree with everything Ethan just said, you know, the world has changed and it's really important. You know, we all had plans before COVID hit, right? Um, and we were all, you know, I'm sure all of us were, were, you know, certainly for us, we were like crushing our numbers this year. We're growing year on year. Everything is really exciting. And then all of a sudden COVID hits and it's, you know, it's a sledgehammer to bookings, right? And so, that's kind of tough to deal with, right? And I think there's two approaches. One is to say, okay, well, I'm going to assume it's going to get better, right? And I'm going to look and think that, you know, it's going to be a few months, it can't get worse. And I think there's another approach which says, you know, do you know anyone that's been through some cycles before? Have, has, has, you know, do you have advisors or people on your board that might have been through uh, the dot-com boom uh, and bust? And then, and then perhaps, um, you know, you know, I lived through the 2008 recession. So, you know, I'm kind of aware of that. And when you look at kind of a lot of the economic, you know, the macroeconomic trends, you know, people aren't sure what's going to happen. It could take right. months, it could take years. And so right. I think it's exactly what Ethan was saying, which is that as a result, you're kind of then scenario planning and you can't have, you know, one, you know, your normal base case scenario, you're suddenly scenario planning with A, B, C, D, what happens in all these different scenarios? And, and, and what are your plans in those, in those pieces? And the biggest thing is cash is king. It's making sure that you can preserve your capital to make sure that, you know, whatever the scenario happens, you're going to be fine and through uh, and can come through it. And I think that's really been our approach as well. Um, like Ethan, we've been thinking about it in those ways and, and really um, challenging ourselves to think about what is the worst that could happen. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at a lot of the reports, whether it's, you know, Morgan Stanley or, or BCG or McKinsey, a lot of these guys are providing insights into what they think is going to happen with the US economy. 
it's still somewhat unclear, but we're doing scenario planning around those different worst case scenarios. And so mm -hmm. that's how we've prepared. Um, we've also created a situation where we're also being very transparent with our team. We have all hands meetings. Um, we have anonymous questions. We do all of this stuff so that people can, we never skip any questions that anyone asks and they can be asked anonymously. And so in doing that, I think we're also encouraging our team to ask those hard questions, right? Um, what are they worried about? What are concerns that they have so that you can get those out in the open? And, and, um, and then the task force that we're mentioning, which is on a daily basis, thinking about what could happen next, what are things that we can do in order to add value, because it isn't a normal, you know, case of business, you have to change your practices, and you have to change your budgets and your plans accordingly. And that's what we've done. And sometimes it's extremely hard and challenging, really tough decisions have to be made. But you know, our job today is to be there for our businesses. You know, when you work with thousands of operators and you are the backbone of their business, you know, there's a lot of ways in which we've been able to celebrate in the past. We, we help to, you know, process hundreds of millions of dollars of bookings. Um, well, we can't go away for our businesses. We have to be here. And so as a B2B startup where thousands of businesses are relying on us, it's very important that we're cautious and smart about our future um, so that we can help them preserve theirs. That makes, that makes very good sense. Uh, so one thing that didn't come up there is like product roadmap. So uh, Ethan, how is your product roadmap sort of changing in 2020 and beyond? Yeah, I mean, if anyone is still able to execute against exactly what, they're do what they were doing, the plans that they had, as Juana said a few moments ago, um, that's amazing. Congratulations. I think almost every company on, on the planet is having to think differently about their, their plans, their product roadmap, their go-to-market, all that stuff. Uh, for us, we've reset what our company goal is for the entire year. Uh, survive until we can thrive. And essentially what that says in a really pithy, cheesy statement is all eyes need to be on the fact that survival is key. And if we don't survive, there's no second act. Um, that said, we still plan on there being a recovery at some point. We just don't know when it'll happen, how it'll happen. And so right now we're planting seeds uh, that don't distract our company from survival, but allow us to invest in capabilities that we think will be valuable for us in the future. Um, part of that has to do with the times that we're living in. And we have a bunch of really tough conversations at a leadership level when we say, hey, we think that uh, travelers could really benefit from COVID-related messaging in this format. And, and then you know, somebody invariably asks, well, is this useful beyond the next six months? And a lot of the times we say, no, it's not. There's nothing that we can use if we were put in this effort um, in the near term, but it's the right thing to do. And we think people will really benefit from it. So let's go for it. And then on the other hand, there's stuff that's more longer term projects. And we're actually having these types of conversations with our partners as well, where we say, you know that initiative that you really wanted to invest in, there's never been a better time than when the planes are on the ground because uh, we'll be able to build together. We'll be able to focus on it. We'll be able to do and swap out the technology that you need to. All the things that you always wanted to do, we can do that right now. Um, and of course, that's not an easy conversation because everybody's hair is on fire. Um, but those are the two types of conversations we're having right now. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, priority number one is survival. Priority number two is making sure that we're ready to take advantage of the recovery whenever it happens, however it happens. So earlier, uh, Azim from Exponential Travel, was, Ex Ex Exponential Review was talking with Rafat about how uh, things may structurally change in consumer behavior over the next two years in travel. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the things are that long haul travel may be on the decline, you know, much lower, the amount of consumer spending may be much lower. And um, there's also Chris Hemeter and, and Moira from Enterprise Ireland, we're talking about, you know, will business travel bounce back? You know, the, there's the premium level business travel and regular business travel. Um, what is your take, Ethan, on what may change uh, or what will stay the same after we've sort of, we're getting on the other side of this crisis? <laughs> I wish I had a crystal ball so that I knew the answer. Um, it's anybody's guess. But one thing that Chris said earlier that I loved was he was talking about the labor intensity of hospitality. Um, and part of one of our, our main things that make Freebird unique and special is the fact that we're able to tie together data and technology and hospitality into one package. And so that really resonated with me because I think there's still going to be the same human desires going forward about being taken care of, about feeling important, about having your questions answered when you want, having lower stress and more enjoyment, more delight. Um, but the way that that's delivered has to change. 
Um, and so, you know, whether you're talking about a hotel or you're talking about an airline or you're talking about a car rental agency or tour operator or activity operator or OTA, uh, I think all of those, any travel company out there is going to have to rethink how to differentiate themselves and deliver better experiences using technology and data and hospitality. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons why, despite all the, you know, the pain and suffering and, uh, you know, economic strife going on right now and health strife, we're actually really excited about the future because we think that will have staying power and there's a lot that's going to change for incumbents. Uh, so, Roswana, do you have any guesses about how, uh, you know, consumers may change coming out of this? You, you alluded to, you know, you know, there'll be an increasing look at local tourism and sort of being able to get out of your house and have connecting with some experiences. Um, prior to the crisis, Skiff Research did an experiential travel survey and found that about 65% of the respondents would be willing to you know, prioritize having experiences that were really memorable over coming back, being feeling refreshed and recharged if they were put in a, a choice of having to choose the two of them. Um, how, how do you, is, are there any kind of behavioral changes among consumers that you're sort of anticipating out of the result of this crisis? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think completely agree with Azim on this kind of, you know, international, you know, kind of going down and international trips going down and the substitution effect. I think that, um, I, I do think one one trend that we've already seen is the idea that people want to learn new things um, and they really want to discover their local neighborhoods. They want to um, push themselves to do experiences um, to, to kind of be a, a replacement for things. Like, you know, if you think about our everyday life, it's it's Netflix or it's, uh, it's uh, restaurants. Um, and that was really kind of the, the two major things that we kind of think of as entertainment. I think people are rethinking that. Um, and, and want to have more engaging things. It's more fun to do a cooking class as a date night than it is just to go to a restaurant, but you're, you're having the same thing happen, which is you're hopefully going to have some food. And so I think that um, people are, um, you know, what we've seen with our businesses is that they're inventing new ways and new ideas of, of, of people being able to discover their local neighborhood. Or, or to learn something new or to take a passion that they're really excited about and bring it closer to home. And so I think, we, I think we're going to continue to see that. I think that the difference I think that, that we see also is that um, I think people will want to do smaller experiences. I think people will be looking not to necessarily be uh, in a place where there's hundreds of people around them um, in a small place. So I, I, do, I do think that the, the idea of, you know, going to movie theaters or museums, I think that kind of entertainment is probably going to go down for a while because people are much more cautious. And I think that as a, as a result, I think businesses will have an opportunity um, to showcase the fact that, hey, look, you know, we are, um, you know, we're, we're a group that only does 10 tours. You know, we already have businesses where they're using our tours in order to make sure that, you know, maybe it's a bus tour. Um, you're going to make sure no one can, no one's going to be sitting next to anyone, right? So there's going to be free seats so you can feel a bit more comfortable, right? Obviously, that means that there's fewer people going on the tour, but it also means that people feel safer as they're doing that. And so I think um, businesses that we work with, I think, are going to be advertising and showcasing what they're doing um, in order to m help protect people from, you know, from risk and to help them socially distance. I think a second thing that we're going to be seeing is, you know, there's going to be a big pent up desire to do things, but, you know, I think consumers are going to be a bit more cautious with their money, right? So I think that we've got to be prepared for the fact that we do have, you know, a huge economic kind of crisis on our hands. And so, you know, when you have less discretionary money to spend, um, I think what you'll find is, is operators will be finding lower cost options for people to be able to go out and do really fun things with them that don't require as much of a spend. And so I think there'll be more things that are coming available that might be, uh, you know, $50 or less, you know, um, so that, that consumers can go out and engage and have fun um, with their families, but they don't have to spend as much. And I think we think we're encouraging our operators to do that already, um, to be able to be thinking about how to say, you know, you might have an amazing tour. What's a way of, of slimming that down and giving a similar experience, but allowing more people to participate? Because I think that um, increased travel demand will probably be um, be mirrored with some element of people being more cautious about what they're spending as well. I really appreciated that answer, Roswana, because I feel like that the, well, all of those trends and behaviors and insights into how the consumer may be thinking sort of apply across a lot of sectors, not just in toys and activities. Um, I guess, Ethan, we have time for one last question, which would be sort of like, as you talk to your team, you were talking earlier about how you communicate 
to your team about what priorities are, you know, we, how we choose which projects to do. Is there anything in terms of how you sort of keep people on track? There's a, there's a temptation to sort of like lunge after different things. There's a temptation for team members to feel burned out. Is there anything that you've sort of done to sort of say, okay, these are every weekly status meeting, these are top three things you're or any kind of tips that you have? Yeah, I, I think you've snuck into our team meetings because what you, what you just said is total, totally right. You know, we're dealing with people who are scared but excited, you know, and they're probably listening to this right now. So I hope I'm not calling anybody out, but you know, they're scared, but they're excited. They want to focus on this thing or that thing. They're feeling burnt out and afraid about the world. They're dealing with personal problems. Um, I think what these types of moments bring out is just the humanity for all of us. And part of uh, the job of a leader it, yeah, it, of course, it's to deliver really clear communications, and, and we've done that as a company. This is our new 2020 goal. These are our three strategic imperatives, and if it doesn't fit with those, we're not doing it. You know, so that type of clarity is really important, and we're just banging the drum. But, you know, on the other hand, we actually, as leaders, have to be there for the individuals who are working with us. You know, taking time to talk to them, listen to them. We're, we're not in the office anymore, so, you know, I make time to reach out to folks one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, every week or every other week, you know, everybody in the company and just, just talk to them repeatedly. Um, we, as leaders, have to hold two things at the same time. One is the pain and suffering that's going on in the world and the fear that people have, the anxiety that people have about the future. Um, and at the same time, also give them hope for why we're still working together, what matters with our mission. Um, and if you lean into either one of those too much, the whole thing falls apart. And so, you know, that I, I'd say for any, you know, other founders that are out there right now, just make sure that you're keeping, you know, your heart and your mind open to both of those things at the same time. Because um, if you lean too far in one direction, it just, uh, it just will not be authentic. So I think the importance of being humane has been one of the themes we've heard here. Thank you both. Thank you, Roswana, for joining us. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, stay safe um, and appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thank you, Rosanna and Ethan. Uh, for our final discussion today, we will learn what might be in store for M&A out of this crisis. Please join me in welcoming partner, Cambone Partners, Morgan Lainey, and moderated by Skiff's Senior Research Analyst, Seth Borko. Well, Morgan, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us here at this conference. My pleasure. Morgan uh, does advisory work, which he's a, one of the leading M&A advisors in France, his firm Cambone Partners, which means in other words, that if you wanna you know, sell your company, you wanna buy a company, or you wanna raise some money from, maybe from a VC or someone who's not a VC, that, that you're the guy to talk to. And you founded your firm's travel and hospitality practice. So you're really a, an expert in this space. I, I want to start with asking you, given that you're an M&A expert, and this is the M&A panel, with a question on everyone's mind. So are people buying and travel today? And who are these people and where can we find them? Mm -hmm. Good question. Thank you very much uh, for having me today. Um, well, a very tricky question, very, very tricky questions. There are not so many buyers out there. Are there sellers as well? I'm not sure. Like, I think we're right in the, in the eye of the storm right now. I think. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, different uh, market caps in the market, I think the main problem people are facing beyond survival, I think problem number one is survival, then uh, the, the main problem uh, this, this ecosystem is going to be facing is probably going to be around valuation. So how to evaluate a travel business today? This is the key question. Um, but still, I don't think if you, if, you, if you look at the timing, I don't think uh, uh, selling your business today uh, is going to be either uh, more difficult or easier than um, in, in 24 or 36 months. Um, my, my experience is that um, obviously crisis, especially at the beginning of the crisis where everyone is hardly it, um, it's, you know, no one is really thinking and considering uh, growing through m and I think people are more caring about their cash and trying to reduce their OPEX, which I think is absolutely the right, the right decision. But um, I do believe that m and should still be a part of a company strategy, probably under a different form. Um, probably the word, the word merger will become uh, more common because, uh, you know, in m and have mergers and acquisitions. I think acquisitions means, uh, you know, giving cash in, in you know, to, to, to people, to shareholders. Um, 
it might be a little a trickier these days where, where cash is obviously has a, has a, has a very important uh, meaning. So I think it's, it's a very good call for creativity for us bankers. Um, bankers need movement. So we need, we need uh, companies growing. We need company needing to consolidate. So I think we're, we're still going to be facing that, that, that movement of consolidation. And I, I, I try, you know, with my clients these days, obviously we're, we're uh, very badly and, and severely impacted by, uh, by the crisis. But I think um, we're going to be, we're going to have to find ways to create, be very creative into evaluating business. I got a few ideas here. Okay. Well, that, that's great. There's a lot there and I want to unpack some of those topics. So we're going to come back to a lot of the stuff you said, but let, let's start with, perhaps the, the acquisition process and the buyer's process. And you said, no one's really buying right now. When do you think that that could return? And who do you think returns first, a strategic buyer like in a core or a financial buyer like a private equity firm? I, I, think, I think it's, it's you know, in, in terms of timing, I, I don't see anyone going back to, um, uh, to M&A mood uh, before Q4. Okay. Um, uh, ser- I mean, seriously, and I think uh, probably the private equity uh, that are, you know, have been recently raising funds uh, will be the first back to the market because they are under, they're, they will still be under pressure of in their, investing their cash. They will be cash rich, meaning they can potentially make some good deals. Uh, uh, so I see them probably being, being at the forefront of, of, of the recovery. Um, there will be some exceptions. Um, I think some large strategic uh, corporates will, will probably uh, still be interested in, in buying, probably at, at a different uh, at a different valuation than they were before. So that's uh, so my, my my guess is probably PE before uh, strategic, um, and both will try to take advantage of the the new valuation scenario. Okay, so uh, on the private equity side. Um you know, private equity investors are not known for, uh, for being the friendliest of people. They got their knives out, they got, they got cash, but they, they want a, a deal. So when, when you're in talks with one of these firms, what, what is the advice that you give your, your clients to get the best possible deal? If you're going to work with a PE financial sponsor and you're going to sell your company to a financial sponsor, how do you talk to a founder about that? Yeah, for, first, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend never, never to be in, in the hand of a one single uh, potential investor, always to be able to evaluate different offers. Um, that's, that's why sometimes a banker can, can be helpful here uh, to and, and raise um, in interest from, from potential investors. For, first, uh, create competit- a little bit of competition around, around the, uh, your round of, um, of financing. Um, and then when you say not the friendliest, I tend to disagree. I think I'm being, I'm being sorry. I'm being a little, I'll give them some credit, but, but please tell me. Yeah, no, no. I think everyone has a role in the value chain. Um, and, and the private equity definitely have a role when, and especially these days where, uh, you know, stock markets, public markets have been, have been great at funding and finan- giving, uh, providing financing to businesses, but I'm not sure uh, in, in, a, you know, in the next, uh, 12, 24 months, this, this public market window will, will be widely open for, for trial businesses. So I think um, um, private equity will probably compensate largely um, um, the lack of funding provided by public markets. So I think uh, they, they have a, a very important and a very crucial role to play uh, in that period. Um, and I, I say, I think um, the, probably the, the time frame of the investment will have to be a bit longer. You know, all private equities are designed to invest in companies and hopefully uh, pr- uh, get an exit after three, maybe four years, not more than five years. I think this, this will probably change. Uh, this will have to change because if you are an investor of a business that you invested uh, 12 months ago, uh, basically the 2020 year is going to be a, a, a white year or a blank year. So a year that doesn't count. So you have to, will have to extend your investment period to probably five or six years. So uh, my, my, my question, I think it's, it, might, it might design a new world of, of PE as well in terms of time, uh, time frame for investment, probably going to be uh, a little longer than the traditional four or five years, potentially five to seven years. All right. I appreciate you pushing back on me a little bit there. Maybe the narrative of PE is, is ruthless, is wrong. They, they probably do have an important role to play in this current situation and for our industry. So that's a good insight there. One of the other things you mentioned that I think is we, we can't not talk about is, of course, valuation. 
that is crucially important. And of course, you know, we typically value a company as a multiple of, of revenue or of earnings, and that's going to look really ugly this year. So how do I think about earnings? Do I just do a multiple on forward earnings? Do my past earnings count for anything? What's, what's the deal there? Well, um, I, I think it's going to be a mix and it will have, it will have to be a mix. Uh, obviously, this mix will not probably include the 2020 performance because uh, that, that performance will probably be uh, uh, you know, totally needless. So um, I think it's going to be a mix of uh, the past performance of 2019 and potentially uh, some of the performance of either uh, second semester of 2020 or the full year 2021, which means we are probably going to see a lot of structure based on deferred payment or earn out mechanisms. So if I'm, if I'm an owner of a travel business and I still want to sell, which uh, is, is a, can be a good decision because you know, selling, this, selling sometimes uh, not only important, but also the, the, right, the right thing to do. I think I'm going to have as an owner or as a shareholder be willing to um, accept to have some deferred payments, maybe over a period of 12 to 18 months minimum uh, in order to factor some of the performance of the 2021. And I, I say that because I, I don't think people should wait to see what's going to be the performance of 2020, 20, sorry, 2021. I think one option could be to postpone the all m and process to 2021, but are you really sure this window is going to be much better than today? I'm not sure. So why not try, try to find a way to take as a, as a base, as a starting point, your performance 2019, and, and also sum your budget and also accept to have an earn out, a part of the price that is going to be defined by your 2021 performance. I think uh, it's going to be complex to implement, but I think it's going to be key. So one of the things we, we've heard throughout the whole day has been the importance of pivoting as a startup, right? And saying, okay, well, these are crazy, unprecedented times. You need to be agile to survive. So that's going to really throw off your projections and everything, right? So you're not even going to be able to say, well, look to my past performance to see how I'm really do, going to do when travel comes back because you might have an entirely different business model by then. Is there an easy, how do you think about, like, is there a good way to communicate that to a partner or, or, or can that be communicated? Or if you're in the middle of a pivot, you just kind of say, I guess we're not going to sell ourselves. Yeah, probably. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're in the middle of a pivot, I think, you know, there's no way you can, you can have a clear message to your potential investor or potential uh, buyer. So if you're about to pivot, yes, yeah, definitely forget about selling your business. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk maybe ultimately on the merger side, and this was something that you brought up. Yeah, we think you're right. You're so right that the acquisitions part of m and gets brought up, but we saw some creative mergers already. Companies are looking to grow to scale. I think not in travel, well, sort of in travel, but Foursquare just did a merger of equals. Um, and so tell us about mergers, how that's different from m and Is that something you think you're going to see more of and would you advise that? Yeah, sure. And, and, and mergers um, has always been part of the landscape. It's always, a, 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 you know, a little more complex to implement than a traditional uh, um, purchase of a business because basically when, when you want to merge two companies, you who's going to head the, the new, the new uh, entity and you always <laughs> part of a human, uh, human instability there. And then there's the financial part. Uh, what's, what's, you know, what's my business worth and what's yours. So, and a lot of source of disagreement is there, like uh, relative valuation compared to the others. But I think some will not have a choice. So um, uh, if, if you want to approach a merger, First, you need a lot of humility because uh, it's, it's really something you, you cannot um, start if, you, if you're certain to have, to have the truth, the perfect truth. So you have, a, you have to a lot, show a lot of humanity and humility um, in, in order to, to get potentially to, to a compromise, a good compromise, because you don't merge if you don't reach a compromise. So I think, um, and it will probably be... Um, I, you know, when we say merger of equals, there's, you know, hardly ever that's the case. So it's always one taking advantage of on the other. Um, so 
if you're an owner of a business and you're going to merge with one of your competitors, you might be in a position where you were a majority shareholder uh, of your business and, 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 and get yourself into a position where you're a minority shareholder of a business that you don't no longer own. But maybe you don't have a choice. So I think um, merger has, um, has uh, a few advantages that we're going to see. Um, and I, I, I call for mergers in travel. Obviously, they are complex to implement. And that's why I think uh, people like us, advisors, can really help facilitate the conversation and the communication between stakeholders. What, no, let's, let's be, within travel, what sectors do you think are most ripe for consolidation for mergers? We, we've talked B2B versus B2C. We've talked business versus leisure, domestic versus international, or, or hotels. What, what sectors do you expect to see the most m and activity in? I think... Everything that's related to consumer, um, B, B2C probably, B2C will be, will be you know, B2C is, is facing a tremendous amount of, of complexity, uh, bringing down the cost of traffic. Uh, so we'll, we'll th- see that um, still. So if you can join forces uh, uh, by bringing together two companies that are, you know, fighting basically for the same, uh, from the same words, um, uh, from the same traffic, then immediately you can create synergies by cutting cutting the budget by two. So I think this, this, this might mer- decision to merge will be driven by decision and re- opportunities to reduce costs massively between two companies. And I think in B2C, that's probably one of the, one of the best examples. What about by sector like hotels or airlines or, or, or tour operators? Is there any sector that you think is particularly ripe for consolidation, short-term rentals? I, I, I don't see any, any, any particular, I think all industry will be, uh, will be probably in, in a good position to think about a merger. I think, uh, you know, when you have um, an excess of supply, uh, definitely uh, there's, there will be more, uh, more out of merger. So I don't see any specific area except for online. I think online will be, will be naturally a good candidate for mergers. Okay. I wanted to ask you one little, que- one final question, just as an investment banker, it's slightly off topic a bit, but I'm curious about debt because we've seen a lot more companies raise debt over equity and, and venture capitalists are very good at talking about equity, but maybe startups are not as familiar with working with debt. Do you, do you have any thoughts on, on that, that change? Yeah, I think, I think this is a, this is a good instrument. Debt is a good instrument. It's, it's a little dangerous. It's, it's like a, you know, TNT, uh, but you should, you should be super careful when, when, when thinking of debt, but debt has a huge advantage because with, if you raise debt, you don't really bring the question of valuation. So um, valuation or dilution is, is definitely out of the scope when you think about debt. So my advice to uh, owners, to shareholders that have a chance to raise debt would be, yes, take, take debt for sure. Um, make sure that uh, you don't have to amortize your loan uh, over a, over a too short period of time and make sure you have ideally access to what we call full peak, full peak meaning you, you reimburse the debt at, the, at maturity and you pay just only a little bit of, um, of interest. But I think definitely people should consider more and more um, getting debt, uh, whether it's, it's given by private investors or, or commercial banks, definitely bank should be a way to, to uh, help um, the whole industry to go through that storm. All right. Well, Morgan, thank you so much for this conversation. Is there a way that people can get in touch with you or? Sure. Um, I'm, you know, over the phone, I'm uh, email, everything that's, uh, that's feasible. I'll, I'll communicate my, my contact details. I'm happy to take any, any questions on what's going to be the M&A landscape in travel. Uh, obviously, uh, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm going to be active. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Seth. Thank, thank you. Good team, bye. Thank you everyone for joining us for Skiff's online summit today. And we thank, uh, like to thank all of our speakers, of course, for sharing their ideas. We will be sharing a recording of this webinar later this week. You can view all of our continuing crisis coverage on the industry uh, and what is happening at skiff.com. Thank you. And we hope to have you join us at a future Travels Path Forward online summit.